From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to this special edition of Newsmakers, a debate between the two candidates for Attleboro mayor. Hello, everybody. I'm Tim White. I will be moderating this exchange and asking questions along with my colleague, 12 News Politics Editor, Ted Nisi. Joining us in studio, the candidates for mayor of the ninth largest city in Massachusetts, Attleboro, incumbent mayor Paul Haro and challenger Todd McGee. Mr. Haro, Mr. McGee, thanks again for agreeing to take part. Ninth largest city in our region, in not our region. in all of Massachusetts. Thank you, in our region. Good <laughs> correction off the top. Uh, thank you for agreeing to take part in this debate. As always, we uh, don't have a strict format to these exchanges. We're looking for an open and honest discussion of the issues. If we feel that you're not answering the question or you take too long, we're going to jump in. Let's dive right in. Uh, gentlemen, I, I watched the, the recent debate hosted by the Sun Chronicle, and, and one could easily walk away from that thinking there are very few policy differences between the two of you. What would you say is the most important policy difference between you and your opponent, Mr. Harrell? Um, one of the things that I've observed over the last uh, several months is that the decisions I make uh, are made with the department heads. I never ever make decisions alone. And a lot of those decisions end up becoming a policy or some type of action plan in, in Attleboro. Um, Mr. McGee, my opponent, however, he's taken issue with a number of these things. And I find that you know if he were to ever get elected mayor, he would be at odds with a lot of the department heads. Uh, because as I said, I never make decisions alone. There's a well thought out reason for everything. And um, you know, it's a lot of the things that he's taken issue with you know, are directly from the department heads themselves. And, you know, I end up becoming the face of that. But again, it's because we work well together. Mr. McGee, before we get to what you identify as the largest difference, policy uh, difference between the two of you, he says you might clash with department heads there. How do you respond? Absolutely not. And what I would say a great differentiator is that my administration is going to focus on the people's needs and balance that with the many projects that are needed within the city. I've met with residents during my campaigning uh, opportunity to campaign and I've spoke with residents that can no longer afford to live in the city. I've spoke with a resident that has uh, our rat infestation problem within the city, a homeowner that's trapped 27 rats and only to hear don't call city hall when they reached out to the city. So I would focus directly on the people's needs that are seniors that are in great need of, uh, which was pointed out in the Council on Aging report back in uh, dated June of 2020. So there's a number of quality of life issues that I want to champion along with the needed infrastructure balance within the city. Well, I want to let uh, Mr. Haro respond to that. And actually, uh, Mr. Haro, that was one of the questions that Ted and I had here, is that your opponent has criticized you. Let's zero in mm -hmm. on the rat mm -hmm. infestation that he said uh, is facing the city right now. He's basically saying, you haven't done enough oh, on a very not. basic city issue here. No, absolutely not. First of all, his uh, quote, don't call City Hall, is something the Sun Chronicle wrote, nothing I said. Um, the fact is that the city only has three different things it can do to address uh, rat issues. Uh, there, there's only a limited uh, legal authority that the city has. Number one, and I don't th think my opponent knows this, number one, um, the city can r order remediation on city property. We can address rat problems on city property. Number two, if a resident has a rat problem at their home um, or at their business the city can come in and we can look at what the conditions are and then we can uh, advise them and you know rec make recommendations on how to reduce the rat problems number three uh, if a private property whether it's a business or a home is the source of rats the city cannot the city does not have the legal authority to go on that private property and remediate rats the only thing we can do is order remediation to the, um, the property owner those are our legal options. We don't have the legal authority to go anywhere above and beyond that. We have advertised that people can call City Hall, talk to the health department. I've put that on my Facebook page. We put it on the city website. We've put it in the Sun Chronicle. Um, so this, that, that quote, don't call City Hall, was sensationalism. It, it wasn't anything that anybody at City Hall said. Well, Mr. McGee, final word on this before we get to Ted. Um, he, he's, you know, a rat issue is not something that is unique to the to the city of Attleboro here. Rat, rat issues are not un, you, uh, unlikely to occur in, in, in cities around the U.S., around Massachusetts. What it needs to be treated as is a public health emergency. So it isn't sustainable for the city to go on every property. What the city, in my opinion, should be doing is partnering with the community, 
come up with an emergency hotline, help City Hall pinpoint where the rat infestation is. From that point, we're able to now better identify where the problem is to eradicate the problem and not put a Band-Aid approach on it. Ted? All right, um, I want to talk about the American Rescue Plan uh, funding that's coming to uh, Attleboro, and we'll start with you on this round, Mr. McGee. City is set to receive roughly $17 million between the straight to the city money and the county money that's supposed to be split up, must be allocated by the end of 2024. So it'll be a big thing in the next mayoral term. What's your top priority for spending that $17 million? That money is earmarked specifically for certain projects. We need to be able to look at where those different areas of needs within the city are. Are they quality of life issues? Are they funding issues that would be allocated towards building infrastructure? But what we have to do is make sure we stay within compliance of the way the grant money has been doled out to the communities and as, it, as it's dispersed to the state. But for, for the city of Attleboro, we need to make sure that we have a very well thought out plan moving forward with the allocation of those expenditures. But you'd be the mayor. Is there a specific project? Is there an issue you think that that's a major investment point for the 17 million? Sure. Uh, we could take a look at looking at um, areas for um, Highland Country Club might be an area that we may be able to work towards. Uh, there's other areas within city that are going to be needs. Now, there's a lot of grant money coming into the city. We need to make sure that we're not overlapping, but we need to make sure that we're spending the money as uh, allocated coming into the city. Mr. Hero, same question. Top mm -hmm. priority for that $17 million in ARPA funds. So I first like, point, like to point out that ARPA funding is not eligible to be used at Highland Country Club. Um, I think it, my opponent made it very clear that he doesn't know what the money can and can't be used for. It can be used for water and wastewater. It can be used for uh, infrastructure. It can be used for municipal broadband. It can be used for um, premium pay for uh, workers. Um, it, it can be used for a lot of different things. What but do you we, want to use it for? Specifically, we have about 17 million. 11 million of that is going to go f to the water uh, upgrades for PFAS, the, um, which is uh, something that we have a problem with at uh, Wading River. You know, it's at elevated levels, you know, compared to what the state now requires. The state lowered the standard. That's one thing. A couple million dollars on. Um, you know, the uh, municipal broadband that I've been wanting to do for a number of years. Also, a couple million dollars for um, HVAC at the Attleboro Fire Department, the Attleboro Police Department, the Council on Aging, um, and also the Recreation Center, which if we put HVAC in the Recreation Center, which doesn't have it right now, we might get another hundred years out of that building when it's climate controlled. Also, $500,000 towards the um, you know uh, rent assistance and mortgage assistance because people are down on their luck they lost their jobs they didn't have a, and then also maybe another five hundred thousand towards um, you know uh, lost revenues from small businesses so these are all things that I have talked about publicly that we've put out publicly um, you know but the uh, you know th that brings us close to seventeen million um, I don't want to say everything all at once you know because there's still other things that are going to come up Mr. Mayor says can't use it at Highland Country Club your response okay that's fine but all these different initiatives that he's coming up with, there's no plans behind this. And if there are plans, where are they? We haven't seen them. And that's an issue. The mayor has ran on transparency, but we don't see those plans. We don't see what mm -hmm. those initiatives are. There are conversations for debates. There are conversations for press releases. But we haven't seen those plans. No. Uh, uh, Briefly respond. Absolutely not true. The plans that we're creating have to be done in accordance with U.S. Department of Treasury regulations. Because if we don't do some, if we don't spend something correctly, then the city's on the hook to pay that money back. Just because he doesn't know what's going on, it doesn't mean nothing is going on. All right, Mr. McGee, the Attleboro Sun revealed you have voted in only one city election in Attleboro in your 21 years living there, which was the preliminary election you were a candidate in. What do you tell voters who say that shows a lack of civic engagement until you have skin in the game? Sure, thank you for that question. And I was very clear in my response to the Sun Chronicle that that was a mistake on my part. Local politics is absolutely important. Local politics are where things happen on a grassroots level. It's typically a nonpartisan uh, as far as the mayor's office goes. Doesn't matter if there's a Republican or a Democrat in there, get things done, get the job done. It was certainly, my focus was on state and national elections. In the 2018 election that I missed, I was literally out of country in Malaysia and just didn't have the time, it was an extended deployment, I didn't have time to get in my absentee ballot. That being said, I've owned it, I'm looking to do better, and I hope in this election that our voters that are also apathetic would turn out for this voting election because our preliminary turnout was so low. Mr. Hurro, a political question for you. It is no mm -hmm. secret that you're interested in higher office. Mm -hmm. How can the people of Attleboro be assured that you will focus on the job as mayor 
in what you have said is going to be your last term and not spend your bandwidth on another campaign in your last year in office? Um, I have, right now I'm looking at running for just mayor. That's the only thing I'm thinking about. It's the only thing I have time for is to do the job as mayor and to run for re-election as mayor. Are you leaving the door open for a higher office after your last term of mayor? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it open, yes, because you know I'm not going to close that door. Um, I like what I do. I This is the most rewarding job I've ever had. Um, you can actually make a difference. Uh, but this this is my last term. I have told people this is my last term. In my uh, inaugural address back in 2018, in January of 2018, I said that I thought my next step would be running for state senate or U.S. rep. That hasn't happened. Um, you know, but uh, to Mr. McGee, can I mention Mr. McGee's voting record though? Because in 2017, I knocked on his door. I asked for his vote. He didn't show up to vote in 2017 when I was running against Mayor Dumas. And then he didn't show up to vote in, or submit an absentee ballot in 2018 for the city's largest public infrastructure project in history, quarter of a billion dollar high school. So. I stopped by your house. I asked for you know his. I'll let so, him respond to that, yeah. but I, I don't feel like you've answered my question. How mm -hmm. can you assure the voters that in your final year you're, you're leaving the door open mm -hmm. to run? How can you assure the voters uh, in your final year in office that uh, you're not going to just be campaigning instead of being at City Hall? I'm doing both right now. Right now, um, I am actually campaigning and I'm at City Hall. So I'm campaigning for re-election for mayor and I'm doing the job of mayor. I don't know what I'm going to do next. You know, I, I honestly, God, I don't know what I'm going to run for. I'm looking at several different things, but I like this line of work. I enjoy public service. Uh, you know, responding to people's needs. You know, uh, whenever people contact me with something, they say I need this fixed or I need this. You know, help with this. Restoring their faith in government. You know, and you know, doing the work of the people. It, that's what I enjoy, and so I'm going to stay on with that. M Mr. M uh, McGee, I, I feel like we sort of litigated it, but do you want to respond at Absolutely. all? Absolutely. Uh, in 2000. 2017, you didn't speak to me if, if you came into my neighborhood. That, that's first and foremost. Secondly, let's go back and point to 2012 when your voting record was challenged by your opponent mm -hmm. for state rep. So if we're going to put things out on the table, let's put the whole story on the table. That neither one of us have a stellar voting record. My voting record is far superior to Mr. McGee's when I first ran for office compared to when he's running for office for this one. I mean, you can't even compare the two. All right, and I think we've, we've yeah. litigated that. So let's move on, uh, and I'm going to start with you on this one, Mr. Crow. Earlier this year, S&P, the credit rating agency, mm -hmm. reviewed Attleboro's finances, overall did, gave a positive report mm -hmm. card, but they did raise one significant red flag mm -hmm. about a lack of action on retiree benefits. Mm -hmm. S&P said Attleboro has a large pension and OPEB obligation, quote, mm -hmm. without a plan in place that we think will sufficiently address it. You've been mayor for four years. Mm -hmm. Why haven't you come up with a plan that satisfies them? No, actually, we have done something, and I don't know why. Why doesn't S&P know it? Uh, we actually have. I, I don't know uh, why they don't know. We had an interview with them twice uh, in the last two years. Uh, what we've been doing is increasing the amount of money that we're contributing to OPEB. When I came on board, it was uh, $35,000, and that was annual. Year after year after year, it was $35,000. I increased that to $50,000. And now, you know, the, um, like the most recent conversations I've had with our budget director, we're going to further increase that to $100,000. So closing the gap by using uh, new revenues, you know, new growth, it, it, that's how we've been addressing it. S&P did give us a stable outlook and, you know, it, we didn't lose any credit. Um, you know, we actually have a plan to like, in, increase our credit rating. The budget director, somebody I hired um, from the Brookline School Department, he's actually a former uh, 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 credit a analyst with Fitch, and so we have a good plan. And part of my but plan was I, increase I, it. So I pulled, I pulled the uh, mm -hmm. plan that's there for Attleboro on the state pension website, mm -hmm. and it said city taxpayers' annual contributions for pension benefits supposed to go up 5.9 percent every mm -hmm. year through 2038. Mm -hmm. Is that affordable for taxpayers? Uh, yes, I mean it's it's something that the city is contributing because we offer a subsidy. So you have no concern that you'll be able to find 6% every year for 15 more more years Correct. in the budget. Mr. McGee, same question. S&P wants a more robust plan, it sounds like, than, than what they've heard from the mayor so far. But this is a difficult issue. What would you do about retirement costs? Okay, so, so let's start with this is a consistent theme. No plan. This is a consistent theme with the processes not being in place, not just with this issue, but also with the promise of rental assistance and mortgage assistance that was just recently published in the Sun Chronicle. We have to do needs assessments. We have to look at trajectory. We have to understand our aging community. This is something that is going to affect every piece of the retirement process. Mm -hmm. So what we need to be able to what we need to be able to do is look at those trajectories, look at the um, contributions, look at what the cost 
to the citizens are going to be because we already have citizens that are saying they can't afford to live in Attleboro. Mm -hmm. We have to have a balance moving forward. But mm -hmm. there are only so many ways to change how much is owed to a pension fund, either reduce benefits or have this 5.9% hike every year through 28, 2038. Is there any chance you would try to reduce how much the retirees are getting? We, we, inflation's gonna affect that. There's so many variables that are gonna affect that number. So to sit here and say that, oh, we're gonna move it to a certain number would be unfair. And, and I would be um, remiss in saying that without any type of an assessment, that's hard to really nail that number down. Do we need to look at it and see if it's sustainable? We have to look at that first. I'll let you briefly respond on the lack of plans. Yeah, critique. so once again, just because Mr. McGee doesn't know what's going on, it doesn't mean nothing is going on. For example, he mentioned that there is no plan for the rent assistance. We're in the process of creating an RFP using HUD guidelines, and that RFP is going to seek a vendor to actually administer those uh, benefits, the $500,000 for rent and mortgage assistance. So a lot of stuff is going on that he's not aware of. I, it, it, again, it goes back to his voting record, you know, not having participated. You, please respond. Okay. So this is exactly the point. Going to put an RFP. Have the plan in place before you submit an article or a press release to the Sun Chronicle. It's about planning. It's about implementation. It's about process. That's the consistent theme that I'm seeing. All right. I'm going to change, shift gears here, and I want to talk about vaccine mandates, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with, with law enforcement. And I'm interested in your perspective, Mr. McGee. Um, we have seen some police officers across the country that have balked at vaccine mandates, but mayors in those cities have held firm, saying it's a matter of public uh, and officer safety. Many first responders have lost their lives to the virus. First, Mr. McGee, as a former state trooper, the governor has enacted a vaccine mandate that many uh, troopers are having an issue with. Do you support or oppose the vaccinate or terminate mandate? I support choice. I clearly support choice. What's happening in my former agency, it's a difficult balance. I understand that the governor is well within his right to be able to make the mandate. The other side of that is serving the community and the impact of troopers deciding to leave and resign from their career as well as 168 new troopers are graduating from the academy today. So it's a very difficult and challenging balance. Again, I support choice. I believe that people should have the choice. For me, I made the choice to get my, my vaccination. So part of that choice, you believe that unvaccinated state troopers should interact with the public? That's the nature of the job. And they had to maintain and manage all the way through the beginning of the But the people the they're interacting with, I think some would argue, say they don't have that choice if they get pulled over by a state trooper and that, that state trooper is not vaccinated. How, how would you respond to that? I would look at they managed every police department, not just Mass State Police, every police department, every fire department, every call is a potential exposure to COVID. Again, we're coming back to the discussion around civil liberties. Is it the in the interest of the department versus a person uh, an individual public safety professionals mm -hmm. personal interest as well so it's a very delicate balance mm -hmm. okay mr uh Haro, considering the high interaction with the public as mm -hmm. i just illustrated uh you opposed a, a straight mm -hmm. vaccine mandate for your police department Correct. how come uh Adult police are over 85% vaccinated. So by that measure, we have herd immunity within the department. However, they are working with the public. And so what I've required is that when an unvaccinated uh, police officer, firefighter, or any city employee for that matter is interacting with the public, if they are unvaccinated, they have to wear a mask. And if, um, you know, that, that's, ju that's just basic. You know, the masks catch respiratory droplets and they do help reduce the spread of the, vac uh, the virus. And what if they don't wear their mask? They can be disciplined, and that's very clear. We, we've made that clear. Some municipalities have said if you don't get the if you don't get the vaccine, you have to get tested. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be in place in your city. We test people whenever they show symptoms of um, the vaccine. We don't put people out on sick time if they've uh, gotten the vaccine, but they're showing uh, symptoms of COVID. If they are showing symptoms of COVID, but they haven't gotten the vaccine, then they have to use their own sick time, but we are ordering them to do that. So when they show symptoms or when they come into con known, known contact with somebody who is COVID positive, and we do have a list at City Hall and with the health department, the, the health department shares that with police and fire, of which addresses have somebody who's COVID positive. Okay. What's, what's missing in the mayor's plan is the self-symptom tracking. That was not in his policy as he put that guidance out just a few months, uh, within a month ago or so. Um, it's important for employees to be able to self-track, look at those symptoms. And again, mm -hmm. the catchphrase is what? Follow the data. Yeah. With that, we still have to maintain 
on a grassroots level. That's actually not Briefly. missing. In the, that's not missing in the plan. Once again, he shows that he doesn't know what is actually going on in city government. That is part of the plan. People are supposed to self-monitor and report that to their department heads. In fact, they have been doing that. Briefly respond, then we have to move on. In the guidance that we had saw, that was released, that and also the self-testing. One standard temperature checks, something non-invasive, absent from the plan. All right, but gentlemen, we're actually getting down to five minutes till closing statements. It moves quickly. Um, Mr. McGee, I want to, you mentioned earlier in the debate something about uh, the rising cost to live in Attleboro, and I pulled the data as we were preparing from the state realtors. The median price of a single family home in Attleboro this year, $430,000 a year to date. That's up 12% since last year. Um, demand to live in Attleboro clearly is strong at the moment. Do you think the city needs to build more houses to increase supply? And if so, which parts of the city do you think should be open to more further development? I'd like to see some low income housing come into the city. There is tremendous development within the city. That's a great thing. There is a great need also for more businesses to come in to hopefully offset the tax revenue uh, generated by our, our citizens. So again, the cost, the expense, it would be great to have a sit down meeting across the table with our developers to see if we can try and move the, the needle more towards affordable housing. Mr. Uh, Hero, same question. Mm -hmm. Over four hundred thousand dollars, and there has been a lot of development in the city. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone argues that. But at the same time, clearly, if the if a single family home is up to four hundred thirty thousand, there's still a lot more demand too. So the um, there's a difference between low income and affordable uh, housing. Like low income housing, low income housing is something that the state does. That's the housing authorities. Affordable housing is something that we're pursuing right now. We have uh, seven different apartment buildings going up in the downtown area. About half of those, not half of the units, but half of the buildings, um, one of them on the fences where that's going to be um, a, a affordable units in mixed income um, the, about half of those are going to have uh, affordable units so there is something that we're doing we're, we're offering this up uh, 37 Union Street is under construction it's the old foster building that's going to have mixed income it's going to have eight units uh, but which is about 20 percent a little around 20 percent 25 percent of their uh, units are going to have uh, mixed income affordable um, 54 Union Street is another one that's uh, diagonally across the street from it uh, there's going to be a number of uh, buildings on County Street which are also subsidized. So when the city offers a subsidy to the um, developers, that's what allows them to have some type of mixed income where you do have affordable. And to the point about taxes, it's actually the city council that sets the tax rate, not the mayor. Um, but you, you know, could propose you could propose a lower tax rate if you wanted them to think about that. They're, they're always going to operate within Prop two and a half, and you know unless we do an override or a debt exclusion like we did with the, uh, for the uh, high school. But the city council, the ones who do the deliberations on the tax rate and yeah I do want to have you respond to that to say quick. half I think is very generous I don't think those numbers within those business models are going to accommodate a 50% split so I just that's want to pull that out that's not what I said what I said was half of the you buildings are going to have units but not half of the units are going to be 50 that I did not say half of the units I said clear. half of the half of the buildings we Ted and I wanted to before we get to closing statements we wanted to ask this question we hope it's a fun one uh, Mr. McGee, there has been talk to change uh, of changing the mascot at Attleboro High School from the Blue Bombardiers. Should it be changed? And if so, any ideas on a different mascot? If it's part of the legacy, let's keep the legacy, right? Let's keep the legacy going. Let's keep it alive. And, you know, from that point and that perspective, it is fun, right? We, we draw that energy off of our mascots from our teams, but let's keep the legacy going. Are we going to find common ground here, Mr. Hero, or do you want to change it? Yeah, that, that's a question for the school department, uh, the school committee. You're an alum. Oh, you're an alum. You, 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 you graduated no, I mean, from no, High School. That's true. It, let me finish, though. It's a question <laughs> that the school, I don't get a say in the matter unless I were to, you know, voice my opinion, uh, which I will do right now. Yes, I would like to see the mascot remain the same. Um, there's a, a legacy of that. There's a tradition of it. And, you know, I don't see this. If it's not broke, don't fix it. All right. We have one minute uh, left before we get to uh, closing statements. So I'm going to ask you both a yes or no question. Mr. Rowe has said he is not going to seek another term. Should there be term limits for Attleboro mayor? Yes. And how long? Four years. Four years. So let me ask you, does that mean if you are elected mayor and you continue to uh, you get elected mayor, will you pledge to leave after uh, four years? Yes. Okay, so and you're saying four years, so two terms? Two, four terms. Four, four terms, terms. Oh, so four terms. eight years. <laughs> right, in, four in, terms. and here's the reason why. To get the amount of projects and work that's, that's needed in the city, 
you need more time to get things done. Okay, two years is... 20 okay. seconds, yes or no, in term limits. Then I accept his vote for my candidacy for mayor for another term <laughs> uh, because I need more time. That's absolutely true. So yes, actually, I proposed term limits in my first year to the city council. The city council, through a special act, can do a charter change to uh, change the term limits, both the, from going from two years to four years, but I also do support for the office of mayor, maximum of eight years. All right, now we have to get to uh, closing statements. You'll both have an opportunity to give a one minute closing remark, the order of which was drawn randomly uh, prior to this debate. Mr. Hero, you are first, your 60 second closing remarks. Very good. Uh, dear voters of Attleboro, I appreciate and am humbled by the last uh, two terms that you've given me as a chance to be your mayor. Uh, this is a privilege to be here. We have so many good projects going on in the city. There are things that we're doing that are improving the downtown, improving the number of businesses. We're doing quality of life issues. We're improving the safety of streets by putting up speed radars and lighted crosswalks. Um, you know, we have about 15 miles of new roadway paved. Uh, this, the new high school is on time and on budget. Highland. Uh, Park is now a course for uh, cross-country runners that's used every single day. Uh, there are so many plans in operation right now, and I'm looking forward to uh, one more term, this final term, to finish off some of these projects and leave on a high note, just as I said I would do four years ago when I first ran. So I thank you for your attention, I thank you for your support, and I thank you for your vote. All right, Mr. Ho, thank you very much. Now, Mr. McGee, your 60-second closing remarks. Fotis, thank you, and it's been an absolute amazing privilege and opportunity to meet you in canvassing throughout our neighborhoods. You've heard clear distinction between myself and Mr. Haro and people versus projects. I want to focus on the quality of life issues that many of you have shared with me during my time campaigning. I'm speaking to the single mother that had said to me that she can no longer afford to live within the city. I'm thinking about our police and fire, our public safety professionals that are leaving the departments. I'm thinking about the gentleman in South Attleboro that trapped 27 rats on his property. It's these concerns and more, our seniors, our education, our, our need for more teachers and adjustment counselors, smaller classrooms. These are quality of life issues that I want to champion. Are the big projects going to get done? Absolutely. But we also need to bring back and focus in on the critical needs by our residents. Thank you. Mr. McGee, thank you so much. Mr. Hero, thank, thank you. you as well. And again, thank you both for agreeing to take part in this debate. Nice. I know they're not always easy, but they are important. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate it. And if you missed any of this debate, it's on WPRI.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the Newsmakers podcast next week. Ted and I have another de uh, debate here in studio. We're going to have the two candidates for Fall River Mayor, incumbent, incumbent Paul Coogan, and challenger Cliff Ponte. Make sure you tune into that one. I want to thank you all for watching this week's episode of Newsmakers, a debate between the two candidates for Attleboro Mayor. I'm Tim White. That's Ted Nisi. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.